Discoveries of the ancient world possess such mystery and intrigue that they can make the most unsophisticated person look upon them in such wonder and admiration. In some rare cases, they can possess such knowledge of human existence that dread is carried with it for eternity. The mysteries of humankind and human nature are what made me want to study such history. Yet, I knew that some mysteries are best left undiscovered, for in them lies truth, and truth is such a bitter dark. A colleague of mine, Dr. Henry Tremont, went on an excavation in the snow-swept steeps of Siberia. There, he heard great rumors of a mammoth graveyard. I never cared much for the bones of long-dead animals, but I find admiration in Henry's love for such beasts. He hired a grand crew of workers and diggers. They would hack away at the base of a withered glacier, trying to find more bones and more evidence of extinct wildlife. I followed Henry's excavation closely. It isn't that I cared for what he found. It was more joyful for me to read every letter he sent me and feel the love the man possessed for his work. I'd been a professor for many years, one of history and humanities. Time and lackluster students ate away at my soul, and I often wondered what I was doing with my life. Henry sent a letter almost every day from Siberia. In them, he detailed the great bones of ancient beasts he uncovered. He sent a few photos as well, mostly of him standing among piles and piles of enormous cycloptic skulls with large ivory tusks. I envied him, not in a negative way. I envied the joy he found. That said, his letters grew more and more interesting and more appealing to me the more he wrote. Often, he'd discuss unknown bones of creatures that he'd never heard of. He collected them, of course, and over a span of months, he had an entire collection of such strange wonders. They were not a complete skeleton, though. Henry admitted to me that he did not think they belonged to the beasts like a mammoth. He was unsure where they came from, but he was certain that he was on the verge of a great discovery. One letter in particular sparked my interest. It was one of the last few he'd sent me. One of the last few that I could read and understand. He described that the mammoth graveyard was something more, something larger than what he had initially thought. He described that the further they dug into the side of the glacier and around its surfaces, the more strange bones they discovered. The mammoths were all dried up, but new creatures emerged, ones he couldn't even imagine, and a human skull being discovered around something that he deemed the monolith. Attached to this letter, he placed a photograph. It was the last he sent. In it, Henry stood near a large block of stone in some type of cave. It stood roughly eight feet tall and about five feet wide. Its surface was smooth, and its color was a glossy black. Its eye sockets, still visible from around the edges, appeared to be sealed with bone, as if the marrow grew to cover the eye. At his feet, I noticed many human femurs and other bones that I'd seen during my own excavation of long dead cities. The letter ended with him asking for my opinion on the matter, and to write back as soon as I could. I tried to write Henry. I believed my letters reached him, but something changed within the man that once he responded. I could not make out what his letters were trying to convey. They were a mess of scribbles and drawings. Notes in such an awful handwriting, I believed them to be in dead language. I felt a sense of trouble brewing. I didn't know why, but I just had a hunch that Henry discovered something he shouldn't have. It was then that I took my leave from the university for two months, begging my regents to let me finish the excavation that Henry started. Once I provided them with the photos and excerpts from his letters, they let me go to his aid. And to try. I hopped on the first plane to the Foreign Empire to try to save the mystery of the monolith. It took me a few days to arrive at Henry's campsite. I took trains, rode horses, and joined a caravan of traders when the opportunity presented itself. When I arrived at the excavation, Henry was nowhere to be found. I stayed bundled beneath my many coats and hoods, trying to stay warm. A young man in his early thirties who spoke fairly good English approached me. His face was covered in dirt and sweat. He looked tired, withered, and frail. He shook my hand as I approached. I am the foreman here, Dmitri. Who are you? I am a colleague of Dr. Henry Tremont, I explained. He wrote me about the monolith. As soon as the words left my mouth, Dmitri's eyes grew wide. His dark pupils fluctuated with nerves, and I could see his heart beating in the arteries of his neck. He shook his head. You come to see the doctor? I nodded. This way. 
Dimitri took me to the largest tent within the campsite. He threw back the flap as a massive roar of wind came peeling through the grounds. Snow and ice peppered my face, forcing me to bury my nose into my jacket. Dimitri stepped into the tent, and I did not follow, for in a moment of hesitation, I looked into the dark navy skies overhead. The low-hanging clouds peeled away for a moment, revealing the mass of glacier before us. It stood tall as a mountain, great and powerful. Stone and ice covered every side of the massive structure. It loomed over us, an ancient structure of nature, so powerful that even the sight alone almost stopped my heart. It wouldn't be until I heard the foreman snap his fingers at me that I break my gaze and step into the large tent. Inside, it wasn't much warmer. A fire did sit within a small makeshift furnace in the center of the room. It was the only light source after Dmitri closed the flap behind me. Shadows engulfed the tent with only the hellish glow of the small iron furnace to keep them at bay. A horrendous odor that smelt as if it were death itself. I gagged upon unraveling my face and it was then that I saw him, my friend. Henry sat at a small portable wooden desk. He wrote away with a long quill on his letterhead. What he wrote, I, I could only guess the mad ramblings. He was sweating from every pore in his body. He sat naked, too. The glow of the furnace light danced across his glistening back as he muttered strange phrases to himself. I took a step further in shock and horror, not recognizing my unkempt friend. His face became matted with a squirrely gray beard and his eyes, as strange as it sounds, were not his. I knew the man for years, but those eyes, they, they did not belong to him. He turned as I stepped forward. As I said to him, Henry, are you all right? It calls, and I see, my friend exclaimed, staring up at the ceiling of the tent quickly. He then turned his head back to his writing and continued to scribble and draw. As I began to take another step, I felt a cold, gloved hand of the foreman rest on my shoulder, halting me in place. I turned to face the Russian, and he shook his head at me. It is all he says. That's it? The foreman nodded. When did this happen? He's the only one who survived. That is when it happened, the foreman explained. I became confused, shaking my head slightly as my eyes glanced to the dancing shadows of the tent. Survive? W what did he survive? The touch of the shape. He demanded fifteen workers help him move the black slab. They all perished. He survived its touch, the foreman said, shifting his gaze from me towards the naked doctor at his desk. He continued. They screamed wildly for a few moments before falling into the snow, dead. All of them dead, but the doctor. He survived and only says that it called to him. I became even more confused. The monolith was nothing but a structure made of black stone. It had to be created by man, ancient man. And such powers were something that I never heard of other than stories from ancient desert treasures. I fiddled my fingers as I thought, trying to piece together some sort of rational explanation. It was then that I looked to the foreman and asked, May I see it? He shook his head. I don't like to go there. Why? It is such a discovery. The foreman looked at me, removing a hand-rolled cigarette from his jacket. He held it to the flames of the furnace before placing it in his mouth and taking a deep puff. Smoke flowed from his mouth as the glowing cherry drew my eyes. He said softly, I think it calls to me too. Please, I said, taking the cigarette out of his hand and taking a deep inhale of smoke. I handed it back to him and explained. I need to see it. He took the cigarette back. I could sense the nerves in his eyes as he looked around the room. He gave an oppressive nod. I felt a sense of shame. I cannot explain it, for I came to visit my friend, but upon the very sight of his unkempt state, I, I could not bear to witness him, for pity filled my heart. My friend, one of the most brilliant men of all, became nothing but a rambling mess. I thought of some of his great works, thinking fondly of his wisdom and knowledge, all the while. Henry continued to mutter in the corner. It calls to me. It calls to me, and I see. It calls to me, and I see. It calls to me, and I see. The foreman and I walked through the piles of bones and skulls of long-dead animals. The enormous skulls of mammoths all faced inward on a path towards the excavation site. Not a worker did their job. They all lingered about the camp. A few men sat atop the skulls, muttering to themselves, and singing old folk songs, wondering how the hell they would get out of such a dreadful place. 
The glacier loomed before us, and at the end of the long, snowy path, I could see a small tunnel carved into the side, the surface before it sank in from months of digging. We walked along the scaffolds and other makeshift walkways just to get to the tunnel's entryway. Looking down into the dig site, I could see hundreds of bones. Most were animal. I knew that much. Others belonged to human, but I felt that some fossils belonged to the unknown. I told myself I was biased because I was going off Henry's crazy words. Yet, the twisted, gnarled bones did not fit any description of anatomy for any living creature that I knew of. As the two of us stood in front of the tunnel, Dimitri turned to me and said, Remember, Professor, do not touch it. I nodded, staring into the dark tunnel before us. Henry had his workers carve out a nice pathway, for the tunnel stood roughly eight feet high and about six feet wide. I could only imagine the months and manpower to dig such a thing. Dimitri led the way into the swirling darkness of the tunnel. He held a lantern ahead of him, but it did no good. The darkness swallowed him and I as we began our trek to the mysterious structure. The tunnel did not extend deeply into the glacier. In fact, it felt like we only walked about fifty feet or less. Though, as I turned my back towards the entrance of the tunnel, I could not see the dark grey light of the early evening. Only black greeted me from where I stood. Dimitri drew my attention, saying, Here. His lantern illuminated the end of the tunnel. Henry's workers had extended the area at the end, making a large circular shaped room that was big enough to walk around. In the center of it stood the mighty monolith that I had heard so much about. It was taller than I had expected. I could not see at the top of it, for it extended into the rocky surface of the glacier. Its sides were perfectly cut through, smooth to perfection as well. The material that made up the black slab appeared to be obsidian, a glossy volcanic stone that glimmered under Dimitri's lantern. I stepped away upon seeing it. My heart could not bear such haunting beauty. The foreman turned his back as his eyes met the structure. He set his lantern on the ground and moved towards the way we came, keeping his back turned. As the light of the lantern hit the floor, I could see the skulls and bones of ancient humans. They were balled into fetal-like positions all around the monolith. I was unsure, but it appeared as if they were buried right atop the others as if it were some sacred structure. All their eye sockets were sealed shut with an unnatural bone growth. I stared into the black obsidian. I watched as the light of the lantern danced across the immaculate smooth surface. I approached slowly, in awe of such wonder. I moved around its side, inspecting the back end. It was the same as the front, yet in the unlit shadows, the back end sat flat in color, not glistening under any amount of light. It appeared to be an empty void. I stared lost in a trance upon seeing it, and in the distance, I could hear the faint sound of beating hearts and dancing tongues. Such a wonder, I, I could feel it do exactly as Henry said, it, it called to me. Don't, Professor! I heard the foreman's voice echo through the tunnel, and I turned to see him. He kept his back turned, but it, it was as if he could sense what I was about to do. Unbeknownst to me, I had extended my hand out as if to touch the black void of the structure. I moved back into the light. Did Dr. Tremont give any theories as to what it is? Dimitri didn't answer my question. He knelt down and grabbed his lantern. He held it high above his head, lighting as much of the small rocky room as he could. He kept his eyes turned away from the structure, not wanting to take a chance. He said to me quickly, You've seen it, Professor. Let us go. Do you have any theories? I asked, stepping away from the monolith. Evil, Dimitri said. You heard its call. I nodded. Evil, he said, turning his back to me. He began to walk down the tunnel, the way we entered. I stood next to the obsidian stone for a moment, not wanting to peel myself away. It was as the light of the lantern vacated the room that I heard the call again. The dancing tongues and beating hearts grew louder with each step Dimitri and his light took. I felt a heat radiate from the stone monolith, and it was then that a panic began to set in me, for I felt the temptation yet again. If Dimitri did not call after me, I don't think I could have resisted. That night, Dimitri offered for me to stay in his tent. It was the second largest in the campgrounds. I obliged, mostly because I could not bear the sight of Henry. I did try to speak to him once more, but he shunned me. The man my once-beloved colleague and friend, 
was nothing more than a lost soul in a sea of snow and dread. The only friend I possessed from then on was Dimitri the foreman. The two of us sat up past twilight, eating watery soup and stale bread, talking to one another about the monolith. We had a fire going and many candles lit. We both feared the darkness. With enough pressing, Dimitri recounted the story of how the workers died. He was not there, he expressed, but he did hear the screaming and crying of his workers who tried to help Henry remove the structure from the tunnel. He said that himself and the others who were working in the graveyard quickly rushed inside to see the workers screaming in agony on the floor before perishing. He said that the doctor knelt before the monolith, his hand extended out, touching it. It took seven men to peel him away, and once they did, he never left his tent other than to drop his letters in the box of the weekly courier. Dimitri expressed that he believed the doctor to be writing more people than myself and feared that more would venture to see the obsidian wonder. Though you still hear its call, he asked. I shook my head. I don't hear it. You feel it, he said. He nodded, lighting up a cigarette and offering it to me. I felt it too, and with each visit, it grows stronger. He smirked. Some stay for pay. Some stay because they cannot peel themselves away. A few men left last week with a few of the big skulls and large tusks. They came back with everything they took. They just wanted to look upon the wonder once more. I would not let them. But you? I asked. Why haven't you left? You know better than to stay. I tried. It's not hard enough, I said. He smirked, taking a puff of a cigarette. You will find it difficult after seeing it. The call extends across the land. It, it brought me back, as it will you. I'm sorry about it. Sorry? I warned you not to see it. You are cursed like the rest of us. I didn't touch it, I informed him. It wants you to. It is a hard fight, but as long as you're here, make sure that we do not get lowered into this black maw. I plan to leave as soon as it's sunrise, I explained. I have an eerie feeling about all of this. <laughs> Why is that you go? Dimitri informed me. It knows, though. The black structure knows. We went to sleep not long after that. I felt exhausted after such a long travel, and to realize that I would soon be back on the road made it even more tiresome. I didn't want to stay. I came for Henry, but left for myself. There was no studying to be done. The monolith was evil, as Dimitri put it. We went to sleep not long after that. I felt exhausted after such a long travel, and then to realize that I would soon be back on the road made it more tiresome. I did not want to stay. I came for Henry, but left for myself. There was no studying to be done. That monolith was evil, as Dimitri put it. I did not care to stick around, for I feared the worst would come of it. I thought of Henry. Such a brilliant man being reduced to madness made my heart sink, for I feared the outcome myself. I didn't plan on saying goodbye, and that broke my heart. Though I felt that the true Henry vacated the moment he touched the black stone. I drifted off into sleep after many hours lying awake. I began to have a strange nightmare. It crept into the foreman's tent on the back of the shadows of the night, seeping into my mind like a virus set to destroy me. I imagined myself waking up and hearing the call of the great monolith. I exited the tent without my jacket or scarf. I stood in the roaring winds being pelted by snow and ice that came down from the glacier. I could not feel them for a fire burned within me. Sweat flowed from my body, dampening my clothes. I marched past the massive craniums of the ancient beasts. I dared not look at them, for the call of the monolith exited from the dead gaping jaws. Their tusks warped and twisted under the winds as if they were bent by nature itself. I slowly made my way back to the tunnel, fearful yet desiring what sat at the back of it. The call grew louder and vibrant off the stone walls of the tunnel. I moved inside, finding shelter from the extreme cold of the outside, though I could not feel it. I marched through the swirling darkness. Moving closer to the end of the tunnel, the call swirled around me with the shadows of the tunnel, as if it took physical form. When I arrived at the monolith, I stood in its presence, basking in the unimaginable heat that radiated from it. I held my hand out, wanting to touch it, needing to touch it. I could not see it at first, though for the darkness of the tunnel hid it from my vision, yet as my hand grew closer I could see a cold violet glow sweep from its sides. The aura felt almost blinding to me, yet I needed to see what sat on the other end. My bare hands grew closer, the heat seared the flesh off the tips of my fingers. I flattened my hands, spreading the heat across my palms, and I felt the ancient wisdom of its creator begin to flow through my body. 
I cannot lie. It felt of ecstasy. It was then, when only a centimeter away from embracing the stone with my touch, that I heard someone call from me. Professor! I turned my head, seeing Dimitri standing in the tunnel. He held a lantern out ahead of him, and only as the light of the small lantern hit my eyes did I realize that I was not dreaming. I stood in the tunnel, absorbing the heat and listening to the call of the ancient wonder. My reality slowly came into view and I lowered my hand, realizing the mistake I foolishly made. It was then that Dimitri reached out, trying to grab a hold of me. As if they were living, crept from the shadows and somehow tripped the oncoming Russian, he fell forward towards me and I tried to catch him. His lantern hurled my direction and shattered against the obsidian structure. Flame and oil covered it instantly, causing me to flinch and move out of the way. Dimitri extended a hand as if asking me to catch him, but it was not me who responded. Before the foreman realized what was happening, his hand rested against the stone structure. He should have fallen forward onto his face, but it was as if the structure wanted him to be safe and held him in place for a moment. Floating above the skeletons of the floor, slowly, Dimitri's legs lowered, kneeling before the monolith as his hands stayed connected. The flames roared wildly around the structure, forcing me to move away and fall onto my back. I shielded my eyes for a moment, but the swirling darkness suffocated the flames quickly and the purple glow that seeped from the structure's sides grew brighter, more vibrant. The calling stopped. Everything went silent. Then, a strange sound echoed from the monolith. It sounded as if a sword were being sheathed in a metal hilt. Everything fell quiet. Dimitri looked back at me and said, I cannot remove my hand. Suddenly, as if a hurricane roared inside the tunnel, a cacophony of noises swallowed the two of us. It was deafening, and the call of the monolith danced somewhere behind it. The black stone glowed with a vibrant white light. It became translucent as if the monolith was no longer a physical structure, but rather a specter before the foreman. Dimitri screamed wildly, and the same radiant violet glow seeped from his eyes as he stared into the white abyss. I too could not look away, for images flashed within the structure. I could see fields of black sand and decaying flowers. I could see tall stone structures. I could see towers of ivory and obsidian. I could see a red sun glowing on an empty horizon with black stars twinkling. I could see my own life laid out like pieces on a chessboard. I could see a looming figure across the black ocean. I could see a tall obsidian pyramid, and above it, I could see a wild mass of chaos and dread. I could not look away. I tried. I felt the pull for me to touch the structure. I wanted to see more. I had to see more. I reached my hand out again, but a scream from the foreman caused me to retreat. His mouth sat agape, and life vacant from his face with each passing second. His screams at first sounded like human, but grew into a deep, monstrous bellow that echoed from the tunnel and rolled across the glacier. His voice hollowed and deepened, no longer belonging to him. His eyes radiated that hellish violet as he continually screamed, It calls, and I see. It calls, and I see. It calls, and I see. Large black strands of the shadows swarmed around the foreman. They wrapped his body as if he were prey to the monolith's will. He could not stop screaming. I turned my back and ran from the tunnel. The glow of the white ore did not light the path for me. I stumbled in the darkness, trying to escape, but I feared it too late for the foreman. I feared it too late for my own self. But I had to try. I stopped for a moment, feeling the guilt of abandoning the man. I wanted to save him. I had to try and save him. It was then that I looked back and saw the white translucent structure before him and the other side. A great, strange shape that belonged to the darkness itself, for it was the darkness and the strands that extended from the structure were part of it. Dimitri continuously screamed. I wept, backing away to escape. I shouted repeatedly as I ran. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. As I exited the tunnel, the entirety of the camp sat awake. They all exited their tents and I could see them looking up towards the glacier in amazement. Some cheered while others bowed to the will of the monolith. I fell to my knees fearful of what was happening. It was then that I looked up and could see the glowing white of the monolith, piercing through the glacier and extending into the blackness of the night. 
what low gray clouds sat overhead began to swirl and radiate with the same hellish violet scene in the foreman's eyes. I scrambled back to my feet and ran. I gathered my things from the foreman's tent and took one of the few horses that remained at the camp. I ran away. On my ride, I saw Henry exiting his tent. He smirked at me as I ran, and I could see the pale phosphorus white of the monolith glowing behind his eyes. He screamed in a haunting roar as I exited the camp as fast as the horse would let me. It did not sound human. It, it did, did not sound enlightened. The scream rolled over the empty forest of Siberia and followed me until I could no longer see the beam of light from the glacier. I never returned to the camp. I returned home and spoke not of what I saw or heard. I dared not pique the interest of those seeking a lost discovery. I kept to myself, and if anyone asked, I stated that I never found Dr. Henry Tremont or his excavation. I lie to keep them safe, yet I still feel its call. I still dream of it. I wake up in the twilight to haunting screams of Henry and Dimitri. I envision myself in the dreamscape steeps of Siberia again, walking the cold, skull-lined path towards the glacier. The workers are all there, their eyes glowing with the violent aether of the structure. The white aura calls from the black void of the tunnel. I can feel its call, those deep drums and dancing tongues. Upon entering the tunnel, I see Henry knelt before the monolith. Dimitri and an assortment of workers are with him. The band of them are nude and worshipping the ancient structure. Their eyes are burnt away from their skulls, and only a glowing violet sits within their hollowed sockets. The call flows from their mouths. I can hear what they say. It calls, and I see. It calls, and you will see. I approach, holding my hand out to the monolith. The glowing violet aura of the white light from the shimmering stone showers my cold body, setting my innards ablaze. The same images flash before me, and just as I think that I see what truly lurks on the other side, I awake in a cold sweat. I scream some night, fearful of what I witnessed. Just before I fall back asleep, I can hear the call again. My heart stops, for some mysteries are better left undiscovered. <laughs> <laughs>